I even still have some of my very problematic favorites that I reread every once in a while. Who among us? <laughs> Who yeah. among us? As long as you know they're problematic, right? As long as we own and discuss the problematicness, I think we all have problematic faves or things that we read before we realized they were problematic. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Miss Shelved, your biweekly dose of bookstore love. I'm your host, Nicole Brinkley, and I'm thrilled to bring you another episode. For those of you who are new to the podcast, though, welcome. Every two weeks, I introduce you to an independent bookseller in conversation with an author they love. This week's bookseller is Billy Blaybaum. Hi, my name is Billy Blaybaum. I am a bookseller and buyer at Third Street Books in McMinnville, Oregon, and I am also the founder of Bookstore Romance Day. As an avid romance reader, I've loved Bookstore Romance Day since Billy first conjured it up. Billy is in conversation with a favorite author of mine, Gwenda Bond. I'm Gwenda Bond in Lexington, Kentucky, and I write all sorts of things. My most recent books are romantic comedies for adults, and I've also written young adult and middle grade stuff and a scripted podcast, so a little bit of everything. Settle in as these two talk about romance, of course, and their mutual love of pop culture media. All right, Billy. (laughs) So where do we want to start? Well, so for people listening, I think we should tell them that we have been online buddies, but this is the first time we're actually having a conversation, right? Like in real and not on Twitter or email. (laughs) Or or Facebook, because I think it was Facebook when I first friended you because you popped up in my like weird, you know, people you may know. And I'm like, well, I don't know her, but I love her books. So yes. (laughs) And then it was just a flood of lovely dog and cat pictures. (laughs) That is is my brand. (laughs) Well, uh, hopefully this one won't be unplugging anything uh, because Phoebe just came on to my desk and uh, Sally's border collie like perked up like, hello, what's going on over there? Why does Phoebe get to be on the podcast? (laughs) Um, Yeah. So we talked about talking about like pairing some books and movies. Do we want to do that? We can do that. Um, The reason that I came up with that, and this might lead us in down different roads of conversation is because when I think about myself as a reader, I'm an emotional reader. I probably can't tell you character names or plot points, but I can tell you exactly (laughs) how a book made me feel. And I'm the same way with movies. So it's less a matter of, okay, so this movie and this book share these plot points. It's really this movie and this book make me feel the same way. Yeah, I love that. (laughs) I love that. Um, I did a little bit, so I was a little more literal. My list is kind of both. Like it's sort of the thing that would feel the same, but also share like some of the major characteristics. So I'm curious to hear your pairings. So do you want to start or you want me to start? Um, well, let's just start with one of the ones that I think that I included in the email that I sent you when I first came up with this weird idea, which was uh-huh. Death Takes a Holiday, which most Yay! people have probably seen the remake, Meet Joe Black, <laughs> um, which is also a lovely movie, <laughs> but butter. I have just a deep affection <laughs> for the original black and white 1937 uh, where death goes to claim a soul and ends up wanting to know what it's like to be human for a while and falls in love. And the book that when I read it, I got the same feelings from it, even though it's not similar in anything except timeline was Martha Brockenbrough's, uh, the Game of Love and Death. Yes. Which yes. is just one of my favorite YA novels. 
and love and death are personified and they have a contest and they're each trying to win and each of them chooses a human to be their player so to speak and i don't want to give anything away but it is just a really really lovely wonderful book that i think everybody should read um and Martha's a lovely person, so I also think everybody should read it for that reason. I couldn't agree more. I love that book, and I love Martha. It's so funny that that was one of the movies you brought up, because I actually do have a pitch for a modern Death Takes a Holiday riff with a female death, a rom-com. So we'll see if that comes out at some point in the next few years. Because I also love that movie. If not, you can just send um, it to me because I will devour it. That is my jam. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm very inspired by movies. Like, I'm very, like, to me, like, all all stories that I put in my brain and all art kind of mixes together. So one of the first things I thought of, I just rewatched A League of Their Own recently, which I'm sure everyone has seen and if you have not you really should see it um stars a whole bunch of people including gina davis madonna and tom hanks and is the story of the women's baseball leagues one particular team during the world war ii era and it's a delightful movie that holds up really well so the book that i thought of and actually i pulled this off of the shelf today and ended up reading like half of it which is how you know like a great book that you haven't revisited in a long time which is one of karen joy fowler's books that i think a lot of people haven't read and i love karen i love all of her books we are actually friendly with her and we've been doing like weekly um zoom since the pandemic started with some of our friends that are spread all over uh, and Karen is one of them. So I'm obsessed with her. It's one of those best case scenario things where you become friends with someone that you also think is a genius. But she did a 1996 book called The Sweetheart Season. It was her third, maybe her second novel after Sarah Canary. Um, and is her funniest book, I think. And it is about a small town that makes its living making breakfast cereal specific <laughs> and the men don't come home from world war ii so in 1947 the women form a baseball team so that they can try to meet men on the road um and there's kind of ghosts and it's this daughter looking back and telling the story of her mom who was on this team and the end of chapter one has this amazing line no good ever came to me from arm wrestling men. My mother always told me, and these are words I've tried to live by. And like, to me, that's just like the perfect, like dry humor line. And this book is just filled with those. Um, so yeah, that's my first book movie pairing. So I guess my second would be, and this is how I started describing this book to people when I first read it is House in the Cerulean Sea reminds me so much of Joe versus the Volcano. <laughs> Joe versus yes. the Volcano is one of my favorite movies of all time. The haters yeah, are all mine wrong. too. It's a great movie. And it starts out with that drudgery, bureaucracy, monotony, and then <laughs> just slowly bursts into color and joy and love and House in the Cerulean Sea does the exact same thing. And both of them just make me feel all warm and fuzzy inside when I finish and I just want to start them all over again. I am amazed still at the number of people who have not seen Joe versus the Volcano, which is the best Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan pairing on film, period. Yeah. I agree. I mean, that's not even a controversial opinion, I think. I mean, I don't think we have to get into the problematic qualities of You've Got Mail on a book selling podcast. <laughs> you know, a book that makes me feel that way, but is completely different a little bit, is Sarah Coons. Have you read any of her heroin complex books? I've only read the first one. 
I love them all. And, and they give me that very happy, like they have kind of that zaniness, although it's not quite the same thing, but they just make me happy in that same way. Just like a good romance in general, you know, but yeah, I love that book. And also you could pair that one with, um, obviously the heroic trio, which the main character talks about a ton and was one of the movies I was obsessed with when I was a young hipster and Hong Kong movies became something that young hipsters watched here, like before probably most of the people listening to this podcast were born. (laughs) Um, That was one of the Hong Kong movies that I watched on VHS that I loved. (laughs) Oh, VHS. VHS. I remember, which Joss Whedon curses his name, um, but I do remember uh, when I started watching Buffy, I didn't have the channel until like the third season. And so I started buying PAL cassettes from England because all the full seasons weren't released here in places you could rent them. They were like the Buffy and Angel collection. Right. So you could just rent like the episodes (laughs) about their romance. Uh, So I ordered them and then you had to pay extra for the person to dub them onto a uh, form that your VHS here could allow you to watch. So you'd get like this huge crate with like all the PAL cassettes and all the VHS cassettes. It was a dark, bleak time. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I don't even have a VCR anymore, but I still have the first season of the X-Files on VHS. (laughs) That seems fitting. (laughs) (laughs) But what am I going to do with them? Like, I have them. Sell them for a quarter at a garage sale. (laughs) Um, Maybe in the post-apocalypse, you will need to use the tape uh, to, like, make a very shoddy rope or something (laughs) i was in a play in high school where part of my costume was made out of the guts of cassette tapes wow what was the play midsummer night's dream and and you were i played snug the joiner who was also the lion (laughs) and my lion's mane was made out of the innards of cassette tapes because it was i love that it's it's very mad backs yeah i was gonna say (laughs) Come it on. was very very um, 80s <laughs> uh let's see there is a book that i love that not enough people have read called corrupting dr nice by john kessel but i believe it may be out of print except for ebook but it is a retelling of the lady eve as science fiction which basically there's a dinosaur and it's kind of a great love letter to all of those movies screwballs which i know we both love and i think like a lot of my favorite romance authors bring that same energy especially historical romance authors bring that same kind of energy like tessa dare is one i always think of as very funny loretta chase the same well i mean tessa dare did an entire book about (laughs) fan fiction and cosplay in an historical setting She's amazing. Yeah. I can't ever remember the names of these books, but no. you know, basically you can just read all of them. <laughs> it was one They're of the Castles Ever After books. That's all I remember. Yes. Yeah. If you haven't read those, they're fabulous. Also, Connie Willis, someone I'm obsessed with, uh, To Say Nothing of the Dog is her classic screwball. And she's written a lot of screwball short stories and she really loves that. And I know this because the one time I met her at a convention, well, I've also interviewed her since, but I did not know her. And I just went up to her when she was guest of honor and kind of uh, just like, hello, Miss Willis. Like, I love your books. And by the way, here are my theories about screwball comedies. And she's like, yeah, I think you're right. (laughs) And I was like, this is the best (laughs) moment of my life. (laughs) Billy, it occurs to me, so I've been on the Bradbury jury, so I've been reading a lot this year, and I'm on it again next year. But one of the books that I really love that we've read, we haven't made any decisions yet, but I'm not giving anything away. Have you read The Sentence yet? The new Louise Erdrich? I listened to the audiobook. Isn't it? Isn't it like the best? I mean, first off, it is so odd and wonderful 
but also just all of the book selling jokes are just so spot on. (laughs) (laughs) Do you have any customers that remind you? (laughs) Thankfully, no. Um, Thankfully, so very much no. But, you know, also, I am a white person. So I would not have the same reaction. There would probably be eye rolling, but probably not as much of a There'd be cringe, but not as much cringe. Right. But I mean, even like the customer, the guy who comes in, who is very demanding and like has really good taste and you want to give them the thing that will make them come back and read all the other books by the author. Like, I think every bookseller has had that customer, right? I have managed to not have that customer. What I have had are the customers I have slowly converted to being romance readers. Nice. Because during the pandemic, they want things that make them feel good. So you start them off yeah. with women's fiction. You start them off with things mm-hmm. that have a love story. And slowly you walk them over to the romance <laughs> section and start hooking them up with romances. And they're coming back on a regular basis going, okay, what's next? Yeah. What are your go-to starter books? I hand people beach read a lot because it's really approachable and it doesn't look like a romance novel. It's not strictly a romance novel, although the romance is Mm -hmm. really a central part of it, but it's a good Mm -hmm. kind of dip your toes in the water book. I agree completely. We have a little book club at the Lexington Writers Room where we do all books about writers in different genres. And that was the thing I chose for our kind of romance women's fiction month and it went over really well because it was the first romance book that several of them had read but one of the ones that i love to give that's an historical is in ava lee it's Mm. part of her wicked quills of london see this is what i wanted i haven't read this (laughs) (laughs) oh god and i'm like totally blanking on the title uh that's all right i'll get i'll get the whole series (laughs) But it's about a woman who writes erotic novels under a pseudonym. And the vicar, because I'm a sucker for a sexy vicar book. uh, (laughs) Not a priest, because that's a whole level of taboo that I'm not going to go into. But a vicar who is charged with (laughs) unmasking her. And the reason I hand it to people a lot, people who are dismissive of the genre, is that she delivers this speech to him about why she writes what she writes of it so wonderful and articulate and you know fist pumpingly enthusiastic it's just one of those speeches that i'm like yeah that (laughs) so yeah that's one of the books i go back to every once in a while and one that i love to just hand to people who are dismissive i'm like just if you get to the part where she gives her speech and you still feel dismissive of the genre there's something wrong with you. This reminds me a little bit of the Julia Quinn books, the, the Bevel Stokes series that has what happens in London in it. And there is, um, well, I don't want to spoil it, but we'll just say there is a character who is like a handsome dissolute type, uh, who you kind of grow affection of. And during the early novels, everyone is reading these like pot boiler pulps, Um, that are supposedly written by this lady and are very over the top. And there's a lot of joking, like sexy reading to each other. And then of course it turns out later that this character who is a hero is actually the author. I don't think that's a spoiler because you can tell from the flap copy, (laughs) but it's a great progression (laughs) um, and hilarious. Like once you get to his book, Those are the books I really recommend to the people who watch Bridgerton of hers. Those were some of the first romances I read, and I love them. Well, and speaking of Bridgerton, when people come in and they've read the entire Bridgerton series and they want something, I often hand them uh, Vanessa Riley, A Duke, the Lady, and a Baby, because it is Regency set, but with actual people of color as characters on the page. Uh Have you read Island Queen? I have not read Island Queen. Is that the new one? Yeah, it's not a romance. It is a Mm. big honkin' historical novel based on the life of an actual woman who worked her way 
out of slavery and into being one of the, if not the largest landowners in the Caribbean. Yeah, I have. I think I actually own this book and just haven't read it. Yet. <laughs> well, get the um, audiobook yeah. because Joa Ando oh. does the narration. Ooh. So again, another Bridgerton connection. Right. This remind. This makes me think. So, O oh, founder of Bookstore Romance Day, who I met through Romance Landia. How did you get into romance? Were you always a romance reader? I started reading romance in the late eighties when I was in my late teens and early 20s, because Mm -hmm. there was a lot of it. Um, A lot of it was really bad, but it was readily available. And when you read a lot of books, Mm -hmm. you just kind of grab what's available. I have read some really bad, really problematic content, Um, but it's just always kind of been there. I've gone through phases where I, you know, read a lot of mystery or I went through a Mm -hmm. huge science fiction and fantasy phase and I still read all of those things, but I've always come back to Mm -hmm. romance. I even still have some of my very problematic favorites uh, that I reread every once in a while. Who among us? (laughs) Who among us? As long as you know they're problematic, right? As long as we own and discuss the problematicness, I think we all have problematic faves or things that we read before we realized they were problematic. Uh, there are definitely some books that I will never revisit. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of Joanna Lindsay in my past. Ooh, so that is one that I missed entirely. So I read like my mom's, I would sneak and read them, but I was that pretentious weirdo kid that thought I was too good to publicly read books with kissing uh, until I, you know, grew up and got over myself. Um, you were Fred Savage. <laughs> I read a lot of fantasy and science fiction, and I actually read a lot of Latin American fantasy, uh, was really my gateway into the genre. It was like the heyday of magic realism being translated here. And I happened to pick up like a short story collection called a hammock. Uh, I can't remember, but it's a classic anthology of magical realist stories from all over Central and South America. And um, I became obsessed with that. And that was sort of my backdoor in comics backdoor into, although I grew up like reading um, Alfred Hitchcock anthologies and Stephen King and a little bit of everything. Oh yeah. I grew up reading Edgar Allan Poe and Stephen King. That was when other girls were reading Nancy Drew. I was reading yep. Edgar Allan Poe. Yep. Yep. Sorry. I still have an anthology of stories with the the most dangerous game as the cover illustration. And it's like, this was my favorite book when I was like young, um, <laughs> you know, because it's like a guy swimming away from an island in the dark. And really, honestly, I'm all for hunting white men. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Only certain white men. They are the most dangerous game. <laughs> <laughs> History has proven that. Over and over and over. <laughs> yeah, I went through my my pretentious phase in college was Kiss with a Spider Woman, which is still one of my favorite books. <laughs> I have a copy yeah. that is underlined and annotated and The Master and Margarita. Oh, I was obsessed with The Master and Margarita. And also The Lover. I mean, I was I, reading a lot of, I read everything that was high class, uh, considered like literary erotica classics. I mean, I was fooling no one except myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I read Master and Margarita because my college roommate was assigned it for a class and didn't want to read it. And I read it and I'm like, why don't you get to read this? This is amazing. So I gave her the Cliff's Notes and kept her book. Then she tried to get me to read Madame Bovary, and I'm like, mm, no. I'll admit, I, I read Madame Bovary, but I don't remember much about it. I was also very into uh, Alexandra Dumas, which are still some of my favorite books. Like, those are like your original page turners, you know. The Count of Monte Cristo and Three Musketeers and all those books. I love them so much. Adventure and um, Swashbuckling and Daring Do. How can you go wrong? Exactly. Exactly. Um, I mean, I definitely read my share of like the, um, oh, the Wakefield twins, though I would read those. 
um, in the midst of reading my pretentious stuff when I was a kid. Um, but it was really like, I discovered romance right around the time that I won the 2010 Veritas Award back before RWA was a just a certified trash fire because I wrote about romance for PW a couple times and wasn't snotty about it. <laughs> and and so they're like, you deserve an award, which really was about the most telling introduction to a genre I could have had. But I was like, you know, if they gave me an award, I really should read this. It was like Courtney Milan was just starting to publish around then. I met Sarah McLean at that conference and she had just published her YA novels and had her first adult book coming out. And so Sarah and I just like bonded immediately over the bad art in the tacky hotel. And um, Avon was the only party. It was the only party I got invited to. <laughs> so I met all of, all of their authors. I also remember a very surreal moment of being in a van to the airport with what turned out to be Susan Elizabeth Phillips, who I had just read. And Jenny Cruzy was really my gateway drug. She was the first person who I read everything she had written. Um, and so Susan Elizabeth Phillips was in the van and she was like, I've heard about something called the steampunk. <laughs> and everyone in the van's like, let us define steampunk for Susan Elizabeth Phillips, who is famous, if you don't know, for her series about um, a football team and the players and managers and various romances of people around them. <laughs> And they're my wonderful. First, they were some of the first books I read. My first, last, and only RWA was the year that Karina Press launched. It was the 30th anniversary of RWA, I believe. Hmm. I want to say it was maybe 2010. It was in Orlando because it was supposed to be in Tennessee that year. And there were there was flooding. Yeah. And I took a red eye because it was the only decent <laughs> flight I could get and was on the shuttle bus with Jessa Slade, who is a Portland author, mm -hmm. and met so many people that I am still in contact with, still just follow their careers. Yeah. The conference itself was amazing. And I really wish that RWA hadn't just totally turned into the disaster yeah. <laughs> yeah don't we all yeah i'm sure it was all underneath the surface then and not under the surface for you know a lot of people but it is true that i mean it was obviously i mean it's just like anything right like science fiction conferences which is kind of my home territory they also <laughs> like have many problems and yet like some of my best friends and some of the you know best times i have are people i met at science fiction conventions well you find your people yeah right I started right. out going to mystery conferences i went to several voucher cons for several years in a row and yeah, the mystery genre is not any better. And it's very cliquish. And All very people who run conferences are problematic. <laughs> but you find your people, you know, and yeah. yeah, lifelong friendships are made. Yeah. And I think of the substitutes for that, like BEA to me, like, yes, I would see friends there, but it's so much more stressful and Javits is a hellscape. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like, I, I guess I have met people at those, but not in the same way, like the same kind of connection. Um, no, like, I mean, <laughs> like I, I mentioned, um, earlier, like our zoom call and I'm just thinking about how, like, so Kelly Link is a good friend of, of mine and Christopher's and she actually introduced us, although not on purpose, at a science fiction convention. Um, Christopher's my husband, Christopher Rowe, who has a brilliant novella called These Prisoning Hills coming out from Tor.com this spring. That's my wifely duty right there. I just did it. Um, and uh, so Kelly uh, and I met at a science fiction convention along with our friend Barb. And we went to a terrible, it was a horror convention. And we went to a terrible basement 
very tame because the hotel wouldn't allow it to be anything else. S and M show in the basement. <laughs> and it was like hilariously bad, sadly. And so we left and we stayed up all night in the hotel lobby talking to each other and have been like the best of friends ever since. So yeah, I mean, you, those are the places where you find your people. And I really feel bad for everyone during the pandemic who is in that like first blush of authordom phase and aren't getting to like meet those people who are their peers whose careers are just starting you know at the same time that was a downer that was a bummer that went in a bummer direction bring it back up billy so, yeah how do we, how do we like, uh okay my first voucher con was in las vegas uh <laughs> Uh, and it was Las held. Vegas, another circle of hell. <laughs> uh huh. At the Riviera. Um, Ooh. So this tells you, you know, how long ago that was. Um, but yeah, some <laughs> of my some of my best friends are people I met at that convention. And yeah. okay, yeah. Now I'm getting sad again. Going, but but I want to go back. <laughs> Right, forget it being, people like, are really? overrated you know people are also bad standing in line for 15 minutes for the muffin that came off of a truck like two weeks earlier at the breakfast bar at the hotel or trying to get a coffee those things i don't miss <laughs> no 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 and, and, and the one guy i mean it was probably more than one guy there's always that guy <laughs> there's the, always the one guy that i think any woman who attends a conference probably even some men there's one guy that latches on to them and won't let go absolutely and then there's also the creeper a different a different that guy the <laughs> guy that everyone has to like get removed from rooms or kicked out <laughs> yeah don't miss that don't miss that part at all don't miss that i don't miss comment not a question <laughs> 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 or or you know the always the, well actually oh yeah i don't miss the no. mansplaining um mm -mm. no if, if uh, they wanted I you on the panel you would be on the panel <laughs> that's right that's right trying i don't miss trying no, to be a vegetarian at a conference exactly i was just gonna i was i was immediately going to the food i don't miss the limited menu of an already limited restaurant <laughs> <laughs> trying to keep up with the demand of science fiction people and eating a burger like every day for five uh, days. The straight. one conference that I went to where the bar closed at 10. Like, this oh, is all no. writers and book people. Oh, dear. You're just leaving money on the table. Actually, hilariously, that RWA I went to, they ran out of champagne and, uh, and Prosecco the first day. <laughs> it's like, did you not know who was coming? <laughs> okay, so yeah, back on, on good things. My first RWA, the only one, I was going to the Harlequin party, was walking up with mm -hmm. my hotel roommate who I had just met on a bulletin board. And mm -hmm. when I showed up, she was opened the door wearing a Wolverine t-shirt, so I knew we were good. Um yeah. But we were going to the Harlequin party, and as we're walking up to the entrance, there are, and I kid you not, Nora Roberts and Beverly Jenkins hanging out. I would have passed out. <laughs> <laughs> we stopped and chatted. That is my day. This is Neither the good one place. I will ever remember it, but I will treasure that memory forever. That Absolutely. was like, I have met royalty. I yeah, think I know. this is the good place. Absolutely. Uh -huh. 1000%. Wow, that's amazing. Dora Roberts. Now there is goals. Okay. All right. So I guess we so, should do our, our final recommendations. What have you been watching lately? Uh, I'm rewatching Next Generation because um, I needed comfort. So I've just gone back to rewatching Next Generation. But for a book recommendation, I'm going to go back to the book that really cemented us as Twitter friends. <laughs> and that is A Spy in the House by Y.S. Lee, which yes. is a brilliant Victorian set YA mystery series 
with a romance thread running through the series about a Chinese protagonist. And I just, I love it for all kinds of reasons. It's just brilliant and more people need to read it. And it's still in print and it's in paperback. Yeah, they're the best. 1000%. And I mean, those really are some go-to recommendations of mine as well. Like I, those books are so good. So let's see. I just started Money Heist because I'm getting ready to start working on a heist book. And uh, I'm loving it on Netflix. If you haven't watched it, it's one big heist that goes over like four seasons. Apparently I'm only on the first season, but it's really good. So I was going to recommend one nonfiction pairing. And so I will do that to wrap up. And it's Mallory O'Meara's The Lady from the Black Lagoon, which you would obviously pair with the movies that she worked on. It's a, a book about Millicent Patrick, who created so many of these classic monsters and how her legacy has been forgotten. And it's just a brilliant book. And I love everything that Mallory writes. Um and she also has a bookish podcast, so where you can't go wrong. I guess we're out of time. Billy, where can people find you? Mostly on Twitter, uh, at Billy Book. I am also, you can find me uh, on Twitter at Bookstore Romance. Um, although I have been bad about keeping up with that account since we're kind of between Bookstore Romance seasons. And, you know, at Third Street Books, if you need to buy a book, thirdstreetbooks.com. Uh, staff recs are up on our webpage. Yay. And you can find me at gwendabond.com or at Gwenda, G-W-E-N-D-A on Twitter or Gwenda Bond anywhere else, Instagram for pet photos, especially. Those are really the only places I'm. I mostly hang out on Twitter and, and Instagram far too commonly. And you can also find me frequently at my local bookstore, uh, Joseph Beth Booksellers, buying books and talking to all of their lovely booksellers. And I think that's everything. Oh, thank you all for listening. Um, this has been fun. <laughs> Sorry, we got distracted by shiny objects a lot. Um, but I hope you enjoyed <laughs> We knew that our- was going to happen. Yeah, we did. We knew that there were going to be tangents and we weren't going to stay on task. Uh, So I, I hope you had as much fun as we did. And so another episode comes to a close. Thank you so much for listening and to Gwenda and Billy for taking the time. You know the usual spiel. If you like what we do, make sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Slap a five star rating and leave a review while you're at it, et cetera, et cetera. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Until then, happy reading.